our main program that's coming up is meant to confront you with something different, something different to think about. Fellow member Paul Crabo, who's here to introduce the speaker, is a Seattle native, a former Boeing electrical engineer, and on the Seattle City Council from 1975 to 1991. He happened upon our speaker some years ago at the Seattle International Festival, casually asking him, what you, what's up there on your computer? Hearing the riveting answer, and later when he had a chance being on the program committee, he thought we'd be interested in that riveting answer. Please welcome Paul Crabble to tell us what he found out. Good afternoon. I have the very pleasant task today of introducing to you Tom McKenna. Tom was born in the Rainier Valley, went to Victor Franklin High School, went to the University of Washington, and in 1989 joined the uh, Microsoft Corporation. That was a very clever thing to do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he is today and has been since the founding in 1996 the full-time unpaid executive director of the Densho Project. Densho is a Japanese term which means to pass on to subsequent generations. <clears throat> Their mission is to preserve, using the internet and largely based on personal testimony, the history of Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated during World War II. Back, and John mentioned this, we, we were on the same board, and I did say, what are you up to? And so he told her it, and he whipped out his laptop computer and brought up a picture of Aki Kurosa talking with it about her experiences as a detainee. Aki Kurosa, who touched for so many years at a um, <coughs> Laurelhurst uh, school, who was uh, pivotal in starting up the uh, Head Start program in the city of Seattle, and, he, and who had a Seattle middle school named after her, and who raised six children all since her release from a detention camp in 1945. Such is the face of those Americans who were interned for the duration of the war. Ever since that evening, I have been a fan of Densho, big time. It is a work of art, exhibiting exciting intellect and so much heart. And the major part of that heart and that intellect is Tom's. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Tommy Ketter. Thank you so much, Paul. It, the, the thing in the introduction that I want to emphasize as I stand up here is when I think of who I am, I, I really think back as, as just being a, a kid from the Rainier Valley. And when I thought about coming to speak to this group, I thought, well, this, this is going to be interesting. You know, I, I did not know what to expect. But as I walked in the door, it was great to actually see people that I recognized. And you know, people like Robert Rosencrantz, who I went to school with at Franklin. You know, a, another secret uh, about uh, Kirk Adams. Uh, Kirk and I had our children together at the Madrona Preschool Co-op. And so you know, I see Herb Bridge, and I see uh, Phil Smart, all uh, sort of donors to the Dental Project. So, I just want to let you know that I, I feel so good and, and welcome uh, to come here. Uh, today, let me pull my laptop out, hang on. Yeah, I was going to actually start with, uh, well first, you know, Paul mentioned that densho means, it's a Japanese term meaning to pass stories on to next generation. So I'm going to be using this screen over here. but. During today's presentation, there are three things I, I, I'm going to do. The, the first one is to share the story of Japanese Americans um, primarily tw 65 years ago uh, during World War II. And this would be about primarily Seattle Japanese Americans. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Densho and how my background at Microsoft 
and in places like Weyerhaeuser and IBM helped me think about this project in a different way so that it, it has really a, a lot of impact, not only in Seattle, but throughout the country. And then, uh, for those of you who are watching the, uh, the TV series on PBS on KCTS, The War, I mean, I sort of give a plug for uh, watching that. But I'm going to get started. I'm going to actually start with a clip that I first showed Paul probably about seven, eight years ago. And this is a clip of Aki Kurose, um, who, who Paul mentioned. She was a longtime educator at the Laurelhurst Elementary School. Um, but the clip I showed Paul was when Aki was talking about being a 16-year-old in Seattle. She was born and raised in Seattle. And she talks about what it was like for her right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I just come home from church, and then we kept hearing, you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed, Pearl Harbor was bombed. I had no idea what Pearl Harbor was. My geography was not that sophisticated. I had no idea, and my father said, oh, oh, there's going to be trouble. And I said, well, how come, you know? He said, well, Japan just bombed Pearl Harbor. And he says, we're at war with Japan. But I thought, why should it bother me? You know, I'm uh, American. And then he said, you know, we are aliens my parents. We don't have the citizenship, so they're going to do something, you know. He says, we'll probably get taken away. But at that time, my parents had no f feeling that we would be removed because, so they were saying my brother would have to take on the responsibility to keep the family together because they may be removed or put into camp or whatever. And, and uh, then when I went back to school that following morning, you know, December 8th, one of the teachers said, you people bombed Pearl Harbor, and I'm going, my people, you know. All of a sudden, my Japanese-ness became very aware to me, you know, and then that I was no longer, I no longer felt I'm an equal American, that I felt kind of threatened and nervous about it. And then the whole time we were now getting the orders and getting prepared to go to camp and whatever. Yeah, Aki Kurose was one of the first people we interviewed, and, and her interview means a lot to me. She, she passed away about, I think, seven years ago. But when we first started the project and went out to the community to ask people to share their stories, Almost all the uh, the Niseis, you know, the uh, the people from the Aki's generation, said said no. They said that the the stories were were too painful, the memories were too painful, and that um, they would rather just let it just pass away. A Aki was one of the few that, when I announced that what we were doing, she actually came up to me at a community meeting and just and, and gave me a, for those of you who knew not Aki, just gave me a, a big hug, saying that what what I was trying to do would be so important to not only tell the story, but to heal the Japanese American community. And so, so this was a clip I showed Paul. It really, it really means a lot to me. And Aki talked about December 7th and what happened. And so right after December 7th, a, a few months later, Aki, her family, and 120,000 other Japanese Americans were sent to, to camps. Two thirds of, of the Japanese Americans were US citizens. And they were sent to these camps without trials, without hearings, to places you know, with, with barbed wires. In, in Seattle, uh, the people went first to the Puyallup Fairgrounds. And I know the, the fair has been going on or, or, or just finished. And so next we have a story from another Seattleite. This is Frank Yamasaki. You know, Frank was um, a, a pioneer in his time with TV. He was the uh, former art director of King Screen and was also the first art director of Cairo TV. So he was one of the ones who helped design you know, J.P. Patch's uh, sort of clubhouse and did those things. He's also an artist. But in, in, this, in this clip, Frank Yamasaki is going to describe uh, being at Puyallup and how his high school teacher from Queen Anne came to visit him. During that period, there was an experience I had that was uh very revealing to me in that uh, one day a um, messenger came and said, uh, there's uh, uh, someone who wants to see me. You know, 
not, not a Japanese, someone from the outside. And so I'm curious, and I'm thinking, gee, could it be Norm, you know, Peterson, it could be Tony, could it be, you know? Uh, so I go, and here it is, uh, my teacher. And I thought, God, my, my relationship with that teacher wasn't that. Uh, Where was this teacher from? From Queen Anne High School. And uh, I, I, we shook hand and then uh, just kind of walked, and he's still quiet. He says, uh, is, is there some place we can sit and talk, you know? I said, yeah, and uh, I've been up on the grandstand with some date the girls before. There's on the fairground, the, the grandstand uh, still exists. Uh, so we went up there, and, and uh, all of a sudden, I, uh, I just feel that the atmosphere has changed. All of a sudden, I had a perspective view of the whole camp area. And I never dreamed the rows of barracks that was there. And it, it's, it was, it's a kind of a uh, f shocking uh, view. Because in the other area, you know, there's no, we're all ground level. And all of a sudden, you get up in this grandstand and look, you see all the rows and rows of uh, barracks. They were built in this uh, area where they would have the horse uh, racing and all that. And this guy, uh, the teacher, said, uh, he's, he was telling about his experience uh, during the World War I. And uh, he's, he's German, and his father was interned. And, so he went through a similar experience, and he, he said, uh, this is a dirty or rotten shame that this kind of thing has happened, you know. And, and for the first time, I really felt the impact of what was going on, and uh, it, yeah, it made uh, quite an impression on me. It just Prior to then, I was a happy-go-lucky, uh, carefree teenager. And, Frank's a, a really incredible storyteller. Um, you know, in addition to being a good storyteller, he's also my father-in-law. And, uh, and uh, 25 years ago, when I first st started dating my wife, uh, I would sit around the kitchen table with Frank, and, and we'd, we'd drink wine and just talk, and he would just start telling me stories. And so 25 years ago, I was, uh, I think I was a, a graduate student at the University of Washington, getting my MBA, and I, I, I distinctly remember being at that, at that kitchen table thinking, oh my gosh, these stories are so powerful. They're so important. And even though I grew up in the community, I, d I did not know these stories. Because in addition to you know, his story just about Puyallup, during the war, and I'm, I may talk more about this, but during the war, um, after they were sent to camp, um, the men were then asked to, um, to volunteer or they were drafted to serve in the army. And, and Frank um, actually took a stand. He said he would serve if they let his parents uh, let go. If they allowed his parents to go back to Seattle, he would serve in the military. But of course, the military couldn't do that. And so Frank uh, was convicted of draft resistance and spent three and a half years at McNeil Island. And these were the, the stories that I heard around this kitchen table. And it was, it was these stories that, even though this was you know, before Microsoft and before my career, I, I knew at that point that one of the things I would do in my life would be to collect these stories. And so 10 years ago, um, I, I got this phone call from Scott Oakey. And Scott Oakey and I worked at Microsoft. And Scott was at Microsoft a, a high-level executive, and I was sort of a, a mid-level manager. But, but Scott called me. We had both left Microsoft. And Scott asked, uh, would I do some technical advising to create sort of a high-tech oral history project? And to get us going, we went down to Los Angeles to the Survivors of the Shoah Project, which was a project started by um, Steven Spielberg to collect the testimonies of Holocaust survivors. And so we went down there. I saw what they were doing. Uh, they were using all mainframe technology. And I told Scott, you know, with, the, with personal computers and the internet, we could replicate pretty much everything that the Shoah Foundation was doing. And so we, we came back, and, and Scott was very generous. Scott uh, pledged a million dollars as seed money to really create this, this new type of, of oral history nonprofit organization. This is our, our uh, homepage of the website. And what we decided from the very beginning was to go all digital, uh, to do all our video and digital, to preserve everything digital, 
to use the internet to, to share our materials. And so in the last uh, 10 years, we've collected thousands of photos and documents. And they're all on a sophisticated web archive, web database, so that currently we have students you know, throughout the world who come to our website to look at photographs that, uh, in this case, these are photographs from uh, the Museum of History and Industry. So the other model we did was we wanted to stay small, or we knew that it'd be better to stay small, and to actually collaborate and to actually create a platform that we can work with other institutions. So photographs from Mohai, uh, photographs from, from individual collections. We went out to the community and scanned in photos from people's uh, photo albums. And, and oral histories. Uh, this is a, an image of Gordon Hirabayashi, who was a uh, student at the University of Washington, and then challenged the, uh, the orders that sent Japanese to the camps. In this case, went all the way to the Supreme Court. So these uh, stories we've been collecting. And then the fun thing, and this goes back to my Microsoft days, with all this fantastic content, you know, the, the photographs, the, uh, the, um, the diaries, the letters, the, the videotaped interviews, we started creating educational sort of modules, uh, learning modules for students. This is one we did with the, um, the National Park Service, where the National Park Service actually calls these sites, these detention facilities, the sites of shame on their website. So we picked up on that. And what we did was we identified over 69 detention facilities across the country. Most people know about the large ones, but we, we did our research, found 69, and created this interactive uh, device where you can click on any one, in this case, get information about Minidoka, so photographs, um, uh, you know, uh, facts, figures, you could watch uh, videos. Uh, here's Aki Kurose again talking about you know, how it was living in, uh, in Minidoka. We also took art. Uh, there's uh, Seattle native artist um, um, uh, Roger Shimomura who took his grandmother's diary entries and created 30 paintings. And so we created an interactive module uh, for students, uh, primarily elementary and middle school students. Again, using all this rich materials. And what, we, and what we're doing more recently is we realize that, especially when we think about what's going on in our country today, there's a lot of relevance to what happened to Japanese Americans. And so in the classroom, we talk about these issues in broader themes. We, we look at constitutional issues. We look at uh, realizing students today with all the media, have to learn how to analyze historical primary sources or to be able to read a newspaper, look at bias, things like that. Uh, so these are the things that we go into the classroom to teach about, not necessarily just about the internment, but about what it means to be a citizen in the United States. And currently, we have over 100,000 students and teachers, you know, pretty much word of mouth, um, and with Washington State students and teachers being our, our number, one, number one market. So let me switch, switch gears here a little bit and, and, tell, and, and show another story. You know, one of the ironies during World War II was that after the 120,000 Japanese Americans were put in camp, the Army then came into the camps and asked for volunteers. And many men uh, gladly did this um, because for them, they felt that if they can go fight and fight well, it will help Japanese Americans when they return to their communities, uh, like to Seattle. This next clip is of Rudy Tokiwa, who volunteered and fought in the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Team. Here, Rudy's going to talk about the aftermath of one of uh, the 442's battles. It's called the Rescue of the Lost Battalion. And this was a battle where a, um, a unit of Texans were completely surrounded by the Germans. And for days, they were surrounded. And what the Germans figured out was that this, this Texan unit was better alive than dead because they could be used as bait. That they realized the Americans would, would keep trying to rescue them. So for days, the Americans sent wave after wave of units trying to rescue, break through, and, and save this Texan unit. And the Germans would just pick people off. They would, they would be so uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of entrenched that uh, the Americans couldn't get them out. So finally, uh, the general ordered the 442 to go save the, um, the lost battalion. And over a course of three days, the 442 just fought you know, foot by foot. And finally, they broke through to save those 211 men. But they suffered over 800 casualties to, to save those men. This next clip is Rudy sort of talking about, after the battle, 
where the general want to address the 442. The, the 442 at, at full strength, it has about 4,000 men. It'd be three fighting battalions in headquarters. What the, the general saw after the weeks of fighting in, in France and then after the rescue lost battalion was a group that was under 1,000. And, and this, is, this is what happened. The 36th Division commander wanted the 442nd to pass in review. And so, and he said, all personnel of the 442nd will pass in review. So the 442nd passes in review. And like I say, you got three battalions plus, plus headquarters. And they don't even have a battalion out there passing in review. So General Dalquist turned around and he said to the colonel, when I order everyone to pass in review, I mean the cooks and everybody will pass in review. And Chaplain Yamada said, this is the first time I saw the colonel cry. And he said, this is all I have left. Can you imagine the feeling he must have had to think that he had to order people to go out and get killed when it was these people that put the families into concentration camp and they're still there. The 442, uh, and actually this is, this is still true today, is the most highly decorated unit for its size and length of service. That, you know, at full strength they said 4,000, but because of the casualty rate, they, were, they kept uh, being replaced. And in the, in the course of over, little, between one and two years, the 442 received over 18,000 medals, uh, including 20 medals of honor. Um, and if, and here's my plug for the uh, KCTS series. Uh, if you watch the Ken Burns series that's ongoing right now, they really focus on the 442. And uh, uh, last night they, they sort of talked about the formation of the 442. And I think either tonight or next night, they'll probably talk about the rescue of the Lost Battalion and some of the other, the other uh, uh, battles that the, the 442 uh, did. So I'm, I'm, I'm now kind of switch gears and, and, and come back and, and talk about another you know, sort of personal connection for me. Um, this, this next clip is, is, is Frank Fuji. And, and you know, Robert Rosencrantz, who went to Franklin, would remember Frank also. He was the art teacher at Franklin High School. A great guy. People loved him. You know, easy grader, so we, we all uh, uh, <laughs> took his class. But what he was best known for, uh, at least the period I was there, was he was the varsity basketball coach uh, at a time when uh, Franklin took the uh, Metro title. And so that was a, a very big thing. Later on, he became a, a, a longtime administrator at Seattle Central Community College. And he's still around doing art and, and selling that. You know, one of the things that, that people uh, oftentimes don't get a sense is the toll it takes on the family. And here Frank uh, talks about being reunited with his father. You know, Frank's father on December 7th was picked up by the FBI because Frank's father, it wasn't because he did anything bad or anything, it was because he was a community leader in the, in the Japanese American community. So the FBI rounded up all those community leaders and put them into Department of Justice camps, you know, probably equivalent to like a Guantanamo Bay type of, of situation. And then the rest of the community were put into the incarceration camps like Thule Lake, Minidoka, Manzanar. And so Frank went to Thule Lake and was there with his family. His father had gone to the um, um, a Department of Justice camp. And after several years, they were reunited. And this is a clip I, sh I showed to a lot of middle schoolers because Frank was about 12, 13 years old when the war happened, right about uh, the age of a middle schooler. And so Frank here talks about re being reunited with his father. Oh, actually, let me. No, we lost it. Well, we're going to go. But here Frank talks about um, um, his father. And the, the touching part was Frank had grown so much in those, in those three years. So if any of you have teenage b boys and they go from 12 to sort of 16, uh, during the period that Frank was in Tule Lake, 
what happened was when his father came back, he didn't recognize Frank. And it was, it was a very difficult moment because his father was going around the room looking at people and acknowledging, you know, welcome, be back. And then when he came to Frank, he had this puzzled look and just said, you know, who's this boy? And, and the pain that you saw in Frank's face when that happened was, 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 was such a powerful, you know, a powerful moment. Um, so let me, let me go on. And, and what I'm going to finish off is, is some, some discussion about where do we go from now? Because we've established this really powerful project in Seattle, focusing primarily on Seattle's, Seattle's Japanese-American stories. What I'm doing now is I'm actually traveling a lot throughout the country because other Japanese American communities have now are finding out about Densho and so they've asked me to help them create a national Japanese American collection. So I spent a lot of time in California and the Midwest interviewing people from the Japanese American community and, and putting them up on the website so that everyone can, can see that. The other thing that we're doing and we work closely with the state is to is to increase our educational efforts. Um, teachers, when they see our materials, really want more of that, you know, especially the multimedia aspects. They say it really, it's a really powerful tool within the classroom. And then the third thing, and, and this, um, for those of you know, who know Scott Oakey and have worked with him, you know, Scott is, is, a, is a big thinker. And when we start this project, one of the first things he said was, you know, when he gave the million dollars, he said, you know, this isn't just so much to capture the stories of Seattle's Japanese American community. What he tasked me with is to create a model that other communities can use. And so we are now in discussions with, with other institutions, other communities, and people like the Smithsonian who are thinking of creating maybe an Asian Pacific American visual history collection for the Smithsonian. We, we're talking with the African American community and others who when they see our model of, of not only just collecting and preserving these stories, but to also share these stories in, in educational context, you know, that's, that's an innovative twist, especially when you use the internet, that, that more and more organizations want to do. So those are the next steps for, for Densho that we're looking at. And, and finally, I, I want to, uh, you know, by, by coming to the Seattle Rotary meeting, I, I really want to acknowledge this, the Seattle business community. Um, you know, my roots you know, with an MBA, working at places like Warehouser, IBM, Microsoft, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in the, in the corporate world. And from the very beginning, I realized that, that business people really do want to help their communities. And there, there's a sense, you know, like the Rotary Club, a sense of service. A lot of nonprofits are sometimes um, uh, with skeptical or suspicious of business people. But from the beginning, I knew that the business community could be very, very uh, generous. And so in the last 10 years, you know, our, our equipment, services, uh, software, donations, the, the business community has been very generous to Densho because when you start sort of this, these high-tech sort of projects, these organizations, you know, it, it can be expensive, not only from an equipment standpoint, but getting the right people who can actually create these things. And so I, I want to really acknowledge you know, the people in this room who have been past supporters of Densho and, and, and for you who ha are also helping other nonprofits. I think more and more, you know, having the last 10 years working, uh, you know, worked in the nonprofit area, that more and more we're going to see these, these partnerships between nonprofits and, and businesses. And, and I think the Rotary Club is, is a big proponent or you know, part of that. So again, I just want to, th to thank you uh, for that. And, and finally, my last slide, um, if anyone wants more information, uh, we have a website. It's www.dencho.org. Uh, and I'll st stick around after lunch if anyone has any more questions or comments. But again, thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you all for coming. We're adjourned. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health. Working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.